Hello. Uh, thank you very much for attending. Uh, and uh, I would like to thank uh, Lev for this opportunity and to everybody who participated in the organ organization of this great uh, conference. Um, I'd like to talk about the relation between the wave function and the th uh, 3D space. There are some problems that uh, are, are uh, that were invoked, uh, especially today, uh, that in uh, non-relativistic quantum mechanics, say, uh, the wave function of m particles is defined on a three-dimensional space. Uh, so uh, the questions that uh, can be asked about this is whether the wave function can uh, appear as objects on 3D space. So it looks like if it is defined on such a large uh, dimensional space, uh, it would be difficult to extract a 3D, uh, something that looks like objects in 3D space, but uh, even more difficult that uh, to show that the wave function can actually be such uh, a thing. And even more, whether it has uh, local bubbles, which uh, was uh, raised uh, extensively both by Tim and uh, by Valia and other people in another context. Um, first, about uh, whether it can de describe. Uh, we, we've seen uh, yesterday a great explanation by uh, Lev, which is not uh, contained in this uh, small picture. And also today by Simon, who, who also described the dynamics, and uh, uh, by Lev, who complemented uh, Simon's description. So I think, uh, in my opinion, I, I mean, to my uh, taste, this uh, answers the, the first question favorably. The wave function can look like uh, objects in 3D space. So I move to whether uh, it can be. And my first claim is that it already is, but this doesn't mean too much. So by already is, I, I will show first the picture of uh, two geometric uh, figures in Euclidean geometry, a blue um, a red triangle and the blue square. So these are objects. We are allowed to color, to color them. So why not color them with complex numbers? And uh, if we do this, we can uh, say that any configuration of points or any set of points in, uh, not quite set because you can repeat them, uh, in the Euclidean space can be colored with a complex number and this gives us the wave function. So in this sense, it looks just like uh, objects in Euclidean geometry. This is a description in terms of fiber bundles uh, over, over a base manifold, which is the Euclidean space. Uh, the fiber in the first case is the set of colors, in the, in the second case is the set of complex numbers. There is no difference from this point of view. So you can have uh, all the information from the wave function encoded in, uh, in this way, just like Euclidean figures that we use in uh, uh, school. But uh, there is a deeper uh, reason for this, and I think the reason comes from uh, Klein's Erlangen program, who uh, uh, managed to classify all the uh, geometries that were known at that time, the homogeneous geometries, uh, by a symmetric group, uh, in each case a symmetric group, determines a particular uh, geometry. And actually, it's the representation of a symmetry group. And the figures are uh, objects that, uh, uh, on which the symmetry group acts like a transformation group, transforms them into one, and one into another. And you get uh, uh, everything that you need in geometry. That works for Euclidean geometry, but for many other geometries that were known at that time. Uh, but you can do the same. Uh, with the symmetry group of space-time. So you can have a non-relativistic space-time whose symmetry group is the Galilei group, or a, a relativistic one whose symmetry group is the Poincaré group, and you can do the same to the wave function, and this is what Wigner and Bargman did, and they obtained the wave function uh, as, uh, an, as an object associated to the geometry of space-time. So at a given time, the wave function is an object associated to the geometry of 3D space. Uh, but of course, uh, this is uh, f uh, when the, when the representation is reducible, it corresponds to an elementary particle. And we know that this one can be represented uh, on space and actually is on space. But uh, for more particles, it doesn't seem so yet. How, however, uh, 
these two emerge from the geometry of the uh, space-time according to these representations. So they are objects in the geometry, even if they, even if we uh, say, yeah, but they depend of three n uh, parameters and so on, they are objects of this geometry. Uh, and this idea is actually so good that it made predictions and it explained things that uh, were uh, already known uh, or already observed up to this point. So uh, the classification of types of particles and fields by spin and mass followed from uh, this uh, geometric approach. Uh, the free Schrodinger equation for various uh, uh, spins. And if you add the internal degrees of freedom and use similar, the same principles but more non-locally, uh, you can get uh, what we know from uh, the gauge uh, theories. So this is a very powerful thing that makes prediction and uh, it, it shows that the wave function, even uh, depending of has on how many parameters we can imagine by adding more particles, uh, it's uh, something from the geometry of space. It's not something from some esoteric space. However, I, uh, we can even make a concrete uh, representation of the wave function as a classical vector field on the 3D space. And uh, to do this, we start uh, slowly. First, we take a separable state, and uh, we, uh, where each uh, factor in, in this state uh, represents an elementary particle, so it's defined on the 3D space. And we construct a vector field, stacking them one on, to, on top of the other, so we get a vector field with n components. And uh, this vector field uh, represented, but represented uh, with a red redundancy, because if we multiply by n different complex number whose product is one, if we multiply each of these uh, factors in the product state, we will get the same state, even the same wave function or the same state vector, but we will get different vector fields. So to get rid of this redundancy, we uh, need to factor it out somehow with an equivalence relation, which is uh, defined by a, a global gauge a symmetry group, which has the, just the role to remove the redundancy. So it's artificial, but it does remove the redundancy. And uh, uh, as a result, the orbits of this group, when applied to the vector fields with then complex components, which are defined on 3D space, I insist, uh, give uh, an equivalence class of vector fields, and such an equivalence class corresponds is one in is in one to one correspondence with the separable states. But we know, of course, that uh, separable states are very uh, special, and uh, we if there were only separable states, uh, there would be probably not such a big deal uh, that uh, they depend on different positions because we can always recover them. Uh, up to a constant, constant uh, complex number. So the next step that I did, steps that I did in uh, this reference was to build the direct sums of such uh, vector fields, so actually of their bundles, uh, just to uh, emulate uh, the linear combinations of separable states. So it's a very complicated construction just for the purpose of uh, proving the concept. Uh, but this adding more, uh, this uh, added more redundancy, so it required more uh, gauge uh, symmetry, which has to be global, which is not uh, uh, not so good. I will explain later why. Uh, but in any case, it gave a faithful representation of the general wave function. However, uh, the reason I don't. Uh, the reason uh, global gauge uh, symmetry that I use is not very good is that it makes the structures rigid and non-local. So if you uh, change the vector field here, here, it will change instantaneously anywhere. So you have to uh, make it local. And uh, I did this by promoting the gauge uh, group to a local gauge symmetry. And uh, uh, for this, uh, to remember the way the, the fibers are connected, I had to introduce a flat uh, connection. So then I have this flat connection. This allows the uh, initially rigid structure to be deformed in a way that you can deform it here without affecting what happens in another place. 
because this uh, relation between them is maintained in the connection, so when you apply a gauge transformation to the vector field, you also apply it to the connection. Um, and the, uh, I showed that the usual Schrodinger Hamiltonian in non-relativistic quantum mechanics acts locally on these fields. Non-locality appears if you project the wave function somehow. <clears throat> and the, uh, it follows that you can construct the Fock representation. So you can go to quantum field theory if you want. Uh, and also, it, uh, the construction included additional degrees of freedom like spin and internal degrees of freedom that we need for gauge theory. Uh, it uh, can also include the degrees of freedom of the metric tensor. It includes gravity, but uh, at least, I mean, uh, in this case, it's more evident that uh, the quantum theory of gravity that we uh, can uh, represent like this requires uh, the theory to be background dependent. Uh, not, not sure if it doesn't work if it's background free, but at least it works uh, when it's background dependent. So I claim that uh, this can be seen as local bearbers that contain the full information about the wave function, not only like a reduced density matrix, but uh, uh, and it encoded uh, this information in classical fields, which have an infinite number of dimensions and an infinite symmetry, and this symmetry has to be tracked with the flat connection, but they are uh, classical fields, both uh, the vector field and the connection, and they are local on the 3D space. As I said, it's artificial, but I wanted just to uh, see whether if it can be done, but I would like a more natural way, and now I claim that Sorry, uh, for the details you can uh, check this paper is quite long, too long for, uh, for presenting in here, especially since I think I advanced more than this. So um, I'm interested now in quantum field theory uh, and how it works with the, particularly with the manual interpretation. In quantum field theory, there is a formulation just like Schrodinger's, but instead of points in the configuration space of n-point particles, uh, you need a configuration space of classical fields. And uh, <coughs> phi uh, is such a classical field. Uh, it spans uh, the state of possible states. And the states as wave functions are actually not wave functions, but wave functionals, because they are functions of functions, which in, in this case are the classical fields. There is a scalar product you need for this uh, measure, which I represented by mu, oh, I denoted by mu. And uh, it's interesting that in the Schrodinger wave functional formulation, which is quite abstract compa compared, uh, actually all quantum field theory is quite abstract, but this seems a bit um, more different on some aspects, but you can construct the Fox space, you can construct the vacuum and the uh, m-particle states, and this was uh, shown explicitly for various uh, fields by uh, Hatfield in his book. And also the Hamiltonian acts locally uh, on these uh, states, where by local we know that we, it's actually not quite in the point x, there is some limit that you need to take, but still it, uh, uh, it is local. But uh, this is just the starting point that I want to use to construct a, a picture that is on the 3D space and has more features uh, that look like classical physics than uh, we expect. And the reason I uh, try to make it look like classical physics is that um, it seems that classical physics is more uh, acceptable when we talk about quantum mechanics, we like to see the things moving and acting as much as possible classically, and uh, whatever is quantum to be isolated somehow uh, in a way that is visible. So uh, I uh, want to make the wave function real, and for this, uh, this psi of phi is the wave function evaluated at the classical field uh, phi, and it's a complex number, and I write it in a polar form. And uh, uh, we know that there is, a, uh, there is a U1 symmetry in our 
uh, even in our classical theories that we quantize, because our world has uh, such uh, U1 symmetries. And uh, I will use this to uh, construct a representation. So I don't claim this is real. I will claim this is in a paper that I didn't finish. But uh, for this moment, let's take it as a representation. So uh, this exponential here should be read as an element of the U1 group and uh, is not necessarily multiplying the classical field phi, but it's actually uh, the way the uh, element of the U1 uh, group acts on the field to transform it. So this transformation will depend on the field, on, potential, uh, on potentials it acts uh, differently. But I will use this notation uh, uniformly for simplicity. So um, we observe two things. First, that classical fields phi and this gauge transformed are physically equivalent. They represent the same physical state. Also, the state vector that corresponds to the classical field phi and, it's, uh, the, and the state vector that is collinear of it obtained by multiplying, to, multiplying it with this complex number also represents the same physical state. So I make uh, this uh, interpretation of multiplying by a complex number the basis vectors, which is that when I multiply a basis vector, uh, I change the classical field that represents that vector by a gauge symmetry. I use this uh, isomorphism uh, between, uh, um, not quite isomorphism, so I, uh, I use this uh, equivalence between classical fields by gauge uh, symmetry on the one hand, and between state vectors by multiplying them with complex number on the other hand. So at the moment, please take it as a trick, but uh, uh, I hope I will come not very late with the paper where I explain geometrically why this is so. Anyway, uh, in, if with this change of basis, the wave function null becomes real, and now let's focus on the real coefficients. Now I want to mention that this uh, is not necessary to transform all the field, the classical fields. So by phi, I did not not just the classical fields, but but all types of classical fields that are present in the theory. But it's sufficient that one of them admits a non-trivial uh, transformation under the gauge symmetry because uh, we know it's just the same thing that uh, it factors. Uh, it can get out in front of the state vector. Uh, so we have uh, now the following uh, step. I want to interpret R in a different way. And for this, I will replace the original measure, which was mu, with a different measure, which is tilde mu. So this measure depends uh, on the wave functional. It's a, a measure specific, uh, different for each wave functional, different measure. Uh, initially, we had a measure that was the same for the initial Hilbert space, but I just uh, want to change it because I have uh, just a wave fu functional that represents the universe. And uh, with this new measure, the wave functional appears as just having a bunch of classical uh, basis uh, vectors. So I want to interpret the wave functional as a bunch of classical uh, fields that are defined on the 3D space. Uh, why can I do this? Because I can recover from this, uh, these classical fields the wave functional. So if I recover it uh, from them, I, I can say, yeah, why not use them instead of the wave functional, at least when we discuss uh, foundational things. Uh, and uh, I call this densitized set of gauge classical fields because I gauged the classical fields in the sense that I applied the gauge transformation. And this density is because it depends on, on this density, which, as I said, it depends on the uh, wave functional. So uh, different wave functionals we have, will have different uh, densities on uh, the Hilbert space. This picture uh, is quite uh, familiar. I took it from the accumulation of, but it, do, it doesn't represent uh, actual points on the screen. Um, it just represents the configuration space of classical fields and the fact that the measure um, chooses 
uh, I mean, this measure determines uh, different uh, densities of the classical fields that are present in our wave functional. On the overall, the wave functional looks like this. So in this uh, rectangle, which uh, represents the uh, configuration space of classical fields, we have a wave functional which uh, uh, is constructed by uh, multiplying each uh, basis vector uh, with the complex number. And it decomposes like this. Uh, we uh, the gauge transformations of the classical uh, fields are represented by these colors because these colors are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the circle, with the U1 uh, symmetric group. And uh, uh, the density is represented with gray. And when we combine gray with this uh, hue, uh, we get uh, various colors that represent the complex numbers of our wave functional. So uh, I replaced the uniform measure with the measure dependent on psi. Uh, but measure is not the same as probability. So I don't want to make a magic trick and claim that measure suddenly transforms into probability because I don't believe this. But if classical states are actually the worlds in which we can be, then it makes sense to treat this measure as probabilities. Um, now I have to discuss a bit about how we get the branches and how we count uh, the number of worlds in a macro world. Uh, so uh, in, in the manual interpretation, the branches are defined by a set of commuting projectors. They correspond to macroscopic uh, states. So a macro state is represented by a subspace of this form obtained by projecting the entire Hilbert space with one of these macro projectors. And the, the states that belong to a macro state will be called quasi-classical because at macroscopic level they look like classical. And I'll make the following uh, assumption, which I think is uh, reasonable because it's a question that we ask for a long time. At the macroscopic level, the world looks like the underlying classical, like a world in the underlying classical theory that I quantize with the Y functional formulation. So I borrow the classical macro states to represent also the macro states in the quantized theory. Then it follows that uh, uh, our classical states that are pure classical states are also quasi-classical. So they, each one of them belongs to such a subspace of the Hilbert space. Maybe they are not good enough, those classical uh, states, to uh, construct with them. Uh, we can construct with them, as, uh, as we know, uh, from Hatfield's book, uh, whatever folk uh, states we want. So we can construct atoms and molecules. Uh, but uh, if we take just one such classical field, maybe it will not look like this. And in this case, maybe we should replace this basis, but I will keep this the same uh, notation. And I don't know what, uh, exactly how this will turn out in the future, whether uh, the classical states will be kept or should be replaced by something that looks more like uh, uh, atoms and molecules and uh, other localized bound states. Anyway, uh, I. If I take a macro projector, since this is spanned by such classical, uh, uh, by elements of this classical basis, uh, then uh, there is a subset of the configuration space of classical field, uh, and uh, that uh, corresponds to the subset of the basis that spans my projector. So uh, each projector consists of some classical. Uh, uh, fields, or actually base, uh, elements of the classical basis. And uh, I want to uh, write this uh, vector, which is uniform, but with respect to the new measure, and calculate its square. And when we do this, we obtain this, which is the Born rule, if we uh, allow ourselves to uh, interpret uh, this as a, uh, the measure as a probability by assuming that Every classical world, it's a world in which we actually can be. So when we are at a macroscopic level, we say we obtain the spin to be up, there will be infinitely many classical worlds that at the macroscopic level look like 
we obtain the spin up and we have to count them. And if we obtain the spin down, we have to, to count the underlying classical walls that at macroscopic level can look like we obtain the spin down. And we, when you compare this, uh, we get a bone rule as I show in this uh, short proof. So to explain the difference between how we usually represent wave functions or wave functionals, normally we, uh, we have this on the horizontal, we have the configuration space and the amplitude is different. But here I take constant amplitude and I change the measure, so I change the density on the configuration space. Uh, and now I, I, uh, I, I'm sorry if I was too fast, but I will still uh, have more to say. So this would be basically my, sorry? Okay, so this is uh, my uh, Damascus uh, road experience, so to speak. Uh, so because if we do the same in background free quantum gravity, and uh, let me say a bit that canonical quantum gravity with the page Wouters time uh, and the various discrete approaches that I list here are uh, background free. Uh, we assume that, that they admit a wave functional formulation. So in, not only on the classical fields, the wave functional has to depend, but also on the geometry. And the geometry includes this uh, uh, three-dimensional manifold with the metric tensor. And uh, we have also a scalar product between such states. And uh, this is the key claim that uh, I want to make uh, today is that background free quantum gravity somehow forces us to accept the many worlds interpretation in the following uh, way, or oh, maybe most developers think that we are already forced to do this, but this is a different way. This is the way that I was forced. So maybe uh, in the following way, most linear combinations. So you, you know the Hilbert space has a linear combination. Linear combinations are uh, uh, valid states, but not all of them can be in understood as superposition in space. And the reason is quite uh, simple. Uh, if we have two states with definite uh, geometries and we have background freedom, we cannot identify points from the uh, geometry of one of these states with the points from the, the geometry of the other state because uh, background freedom uh, prevents us. So uh, uh, this forces a dissociation of the wave functional into states that have definite 3D geometries. This is my time? Okay. Uh, now I claim these uh, states have local variables, at least the geometry, but also the classical fields that live on this uh, geometry. And um, as earlier, if we assume that they correspond to un uniquely to macro states, we get the Born rule. Now there are some slides, I don't know if I have time, uh, to show how this contributes to uh, explaining the branching asymmetry. I will skip uh, quickly and I just want to say that at the Big Bang, the geometry is the same, which is constantly zero, at least in uh, this formulation of general relativity. Uh, and uh, this means it's specified by zero parameters. And moreover, uh, for in this formulation, the conditions for the fields will be that they are homogeneous, so they are basically constant on this geometry, so they will also be specifi specified by a very small number of parameters. And uh, this makes all the uh, worlds to be very similar at the Big Bang. So the branching structure is unified as, as, at the Big Bang, so it introduces an asymmetry of the branching structure. Um, I think it looks something like this. So here we have the Big Bang with the states all look alike because the same uh, geometry and, const and very constant uh, matter fields. And uh, then as uh, the evolution unitary evolves the states, uh, they um, have to split because the underlying geometry don't allow them to create interference. Uh, and they have to split, but they can recombine. Uh, so this is not an irreversible splitting. However, if the splitting becomes macroscopic by usual decoherence processes, uh, 
Then uh, we have uh, these macroscopic branches. And if we count the underlying states by the rule that I gave earlier, so these states, uh, I in interpret them as being classical. The wave function here is a classical bunch of states. I mean a bunch of classical states because uh, I think this leads me to a sort of monism of the wave functional. Not this kind of monies where you take the state vector, the abstract state vector, as some people want to do, which I proved it's in, it doesn't work in uh, this article. And the, also this article I gave uh, an infinite number of examples that have the same Hamiltonian and the same uh, state vector, but physically they are completely different. Uh, but uh, they need to have some physical basis, and I claim that this physical basis is the basis of classical fields uh, that I described earlier, only that it has also to include the geometry, and if it does this, or it looks like this, so the, the, you'll see different colors because I show also the uh, phase factors that multiply the basis as it uh, evolves. So my uh, ontological claim about the wave function is that it is one, but at the same time, it is many in the sense that it is a bunch of, of densitized classical fields. Thank you for your attention. I just want to make a technical comment to repeat for other speakers. We still have a few days. Uh, don't try to put ten papers in one in one talk. It is is recorded. What is recorded? <laughs> uh, I don't still. But uh, there is an option. You can uh, sub uh, yeah. submit a for proceeding and people will read it and this might help. But try to present one idea that everyone will understand instead of 10 ideas with uh, very small people yeah. will be able to understand. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. I have a question about um, the, uh, this measure you define on the space of the, of the classical fields and the relation to uh, defining the probability in the sense of the Born rule. So if, if I followed if, if I followed the development of the ideas, the you're trying to define a measure on what I think is an infinite dimensional Fréchet manifold. Yeah, we and know that uh, there, there are there are there are no yeah there is no Lebesgue uh, measure we there's know no, yeah, yeah so in the uh, long version that is on the archive uh, and actually I had a slide in uh, uh, a paragraph but I removed it because uh, uh, I wanted to. Uh, present the broad picture, but in the article I mentioned that the, uh, we know that there is, we know that there are some uh, workarounds, but I don't want to speculate which workaround uh, will have to be important. The important thing I think is that we know that we have, we live in a world in which quantum gravity and in which quantum field theory are true, so there has to be a way to solve this, uh, and this is not particular to the interpretation I present, it's actually particular, it actually applies to uh, quantum field theory and to especially to quantum gravity if we work in the continuum uh, but uh, thank you very much it, indeed the, the, it's difficult to find the measure uh, that uh, works for this <laughs>